Welcome to the Refugees in a New Land podcast from the Times News and MagicValley.com, where we're following a refugee family from the Democratic Republic of the Congo as they move to Twin Falls and start a new life. Here's reporter Titona Dunlap. Two months ago, I started delving into the lives of a refugee family from the Democratic Republic of the Congo as they learn how to make a home in Twin Falls. I was there when I walked through the doors of the Twin Falls Airport the night of November 16th. I didn't know what they looked like or even their names, so it's no wonder that in the bustle of travelers streaming through the doors, I didn't realize who they were until the interpreter pointed them out. All around us, groups of people were shouting as they spotted their loved ones. People talked loudly and embraced each other. And in the middle of all that commotion, interpreter Akembe Blom Bailey was quietly teaching community volunteer Allison Van Gerder to say, Welcome to America in Swahili. Van Gerder was about to become a mentor for the refugee family I hope to follow. Connie Gamba Mulambwe and Beatrice Bahate and their two children, Sarah and Daniel. I was at the airport because the Times News is following a newly arrived refugee family as they adjust to American life. It's a major year-long reporting project led by Enterprise Editor Virginia Hutchins. This human drama has been playing out over and over since the 1980s when the College of Southern Idaho Refugee Center opened in Twin Falls. But the refugees arriving in Twin Falls now face something their predecessors didn't, a community where vocal opposition has erupted, fueled by fears that terrorists might infiltrate the refugee resettlement process. We thought about starting a special reporting project last spring when we learned the CSI Refugee Center could receive Syrian refugees in the fiscal year that started in October 2015, the first from Syria to come to Twin Falls. But when editors put our heads together to decide on our major reporting project for 2015, we decided to focus on a much larger group of immigrants instead, the rapidly expanding Hispanic population in Jerome. Then the refugee issue exploded. Letters to the editor poured into this office. People flooded CSI board meetings to talk about refugees. New groups formed to support or oppose refugee resettlement in Twin Falls. And the Times News sponsored a community forum to let the public ask questions for a panel of local leaders and federal refugee officials. Our reporting team covered the controversy every step of the way. But it was time to launch another in-depth reporting project. So in early November, we decided we'd focus on the next refugee family scheduled to arrive in Twin Falls. Just a few days in advance, we got word that a family of four from the DR Congo would arrive on Monday, November 16. Quickly, we made plans to have a reporter and a photographer there at key moments, starting with the arrival and those first strange hours in a new land, then following the family through the many adjustments that would undoubtedly follow. It would be a huge commitment of reporting and photography time, We wanted to be there from the very beginning, so we dispatched the reporter, Titona, to the refugee center on Friday morning to learn what she could in advance, which wasn't a lot. On Monday, uh, a family of four from the Congo is going to be arriving. Uh, The father is 26, the mother is 22, and they have two children, ages one and three. Um, I'm not sure how long uh, they were in the refugee camps or where they were exactly. Um, All I know is that they're arriving Monday night about 11 o'clock. And then from there, they will be taken to their new apartment in Twin Falls. And they will um, go through a safety orientation with their case manager. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of all the details of that, but I know part of it is um, them getting acquainted with their apartment, how it works, how to turn on the lights, how to use the oven, how to turn on the water. So, Does the family speak any English at all? The family doesn't speak any English. What they, do they speak? They speak Swahili and another language that I can't remember how to pronounce. Um, okay. So probably our best bet for interpreters is going to be other refugees from the DR Congo who've arrived here earlier. Yeah, when they arrive uh, on Monday night, they there is going to be an interpreter with them. And Provided by the Refugee Center? Yes. 
How long does that last? My understanding is that they'll probably have the interpreter with them for about two weeks, and then after that, they will start their ESL classes, oh, and then okay. they're pretty much on their own. So that makes our job a lot easier for the first two weeks, but then uh, by the time that interpreter exits the picture, we need to have our own plan for how to communicate with the Swahili-speaking couple. Yes, after two weeks, um, I will probably rely on the interpreter provided by the refugee center, but after that, I will have to find an interpreter to help me with the rest of my interviews. Okay, so that's a big job for us. To tell this story right, we'll have to ask this young couple to let us be part of their lives to an extraordinary degree. Detona and our photographers will have to earn their trust. And there's the language problem. We'll have to figure out how to recruit a volunteer interpreter fluent in Swahili. Maybe Chandra Upredi could help us with that. Upredi, a Bhutanese former refugee now working for the CSI Refugee Center, knows something about the newspaper because he was an interpreter for the last big refugee reporting project we did in 2011. And I needed to quickly bring Drew Nash into the picture. Nash is our chief photographer, and I needed to make sure he understood the scope of what we're undertaking. Before we get too far ahead, mm -hmm. um, you said uh, Monday afternoon they're going to be doing this. Um, she said the case manager is going to be in the apartment just after noon. Do we have a case manager name? Um, yeah. This name might mean something to you. Chandra Upredi. Do you remember yes. him? Yes. From uh, the Melissa refugee Dablins. project we did five uh, years ago. Yeah, acquaintance. Okay, great. Um, and he, makes, he did a lot of sure. interpretation for us last time we did a big refugee project mm -hmm. um, because he had come slightly before the refugees we were focusing on. So his English skills were far enough developed to help us with interpretation for those other Bhutanese. Okay. Um, um, so he, he may be very helpful in telling this new family that we are nice people. Got it. You know, that journalism doesn't hurt, <laughs> basically. Do we have a backup plan in case these people say no way? Um, if these people say no way, we pull back, take all of this planning, and just apply it to the next family that comes. Okay. Who could be from, you know, a different country. Of course. Okay. Titona started her on-the-scene reporting the afternoon before the refugee family's arrival, November 16, as Upredi was preparing the apartment meant for Mulabwe and Bahati. And usually, before um, before I move in everything, I, I move part of the like this. It's what's called a home safety checklist. So they ask me, you know, questions like their address and stuff, how many bedroom, and what's you know, the condition of the house, basically. So make sure you know the, the lock and door, the door is working, stove is working, there is emergency exit and things like that. So so basically, there's a lot of box or roaches inside and we just cannot put them in just like that because we're not required so it needs to pass the checklist um, and there are like things like uh, smoke detector is a requirement at least one per per apartment so things like that so we make sure everything is in there before we even start moving, moving furniture or anything like that hmm. so so you said that you turn on things like the electricity and the gas and all that stuff? We, we do. Right now it's under the name of the landlord. And we have an agreement with them. So when they come in, um, next day I usually do my orientation. So they need to sign consent saying that it's okay for the refugee center mm -hmm. to call the Idaho Power Company or gas company. So we need their permission consent first so we can get the services going. Okay. But right now it's still under the landlord's name. Okay. And, and I'll transfer the service as soon as I have that consent. Mm -hmm. Every refugee who lands at the Twin Falls airport needs a home to go to, but Upredi told me it's getting more difficult to find housing for refugees in Twin Falls because landlords receive only a tenant's name, not a social security number or credit history. Yeah. Um, I saw that they're building apartments over there by um, Xavier Charter School. Mm -hmm. and yeah, there have been a lot of them. Um, um, I know right here in Robbins that they've got tons of three flexes, uh, mm -hmm. three bedrooms. There are probably around 20 units by Smith's one bedroom and stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's hard because they don't want to rent it to refugees. And mm -hmm. uh, part of it is sometimes they don't understand how the process works. And, mm -hmm. uh, 
Renting, you know, I don't blame them either at the same time. You're just giving place um, with, with a lot of risk sometimes. You don't know. Because this is how it works. So mm -hmm. right now, all I have for this family is their name and date of birth. Mm -hmm. So no ID card, no social security card, no credit history. Now, a typical landlord who is in business would require me to bring an ID, require me to have a social security mm -hmm. card, uh, credit history, which they don't have any of those. Mm -hmm. So so that's part of it is that's why I think it gets complicated mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. But those who are already working, you know, they, they understand how it works. These refugees would arrive to an Idaho winter, so they'd need warm clothes too. It's required in the winter because it gets really cold. So. Um, Usually, they would come in here like, let's say, this family coming tonight, I'll meet them tomorrow. Mm -hmm. When I'm done with orientation, I'll take them, so at least like in one coat, one hat, one glove, one pair of shoes, they don't have any. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty minimal. That same afternoon, as Upredi was getting the apartment ready, Idaho Governor Butch Otter called on the president to halt refugee resettlement in reaction to the terrorist attacks in Paris. Do you know, have you guys received like any people calling in because of the whole thing that happened in Paris? And then I saw that there were some states that were saying that they don't want refugees. Not that I know of. Honestly, I don't know. Okay. Uh, my boss is the one yeah. who's getting that calls and I'm usually not in my office. I'm out doing mm -hmm. moving furniture, taking care of the landlords and things like that. Yeah. But I think there are phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> We're used to phone calls anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And I think what will happen in Paris definitely will impact mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. And it always does if something happens. Yeah. So. What time are you going to go to the airport? Um, usually I. Um, and they're usually around 10 20. Okay. The plane usually arrives around 10 50, 11 o'clock. So mm -hmm. then I will just go there early, just in case they're early so they're not there getting lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. So far, the family who's coming is just data on a page a family of four, ages, names, country of origin. I'd read up on the DR Congo. Virginia and I had gone over lists of questions and topics we wanted to explore, but there wasn't much more I could do to prepare for this assignment. I arrived at the airport half an hour before the plane was scheduled to land and waited in the parking lot until I saw the refugee center's van pull in. The flight's other passengers received noisy greetings from people who had come to meet them, but when Malabwe and Bahati and their children came through the terminal doors, the greeting was formal and quiet. Hello. Titona. Yeah. Titona. Okay. Nice to meet you. This is Drew. Hello. Pleasure to meet you. Um, you can tell them we're from the newspaper and we're interested in writing a story about them and their experience here for the first time. They have to talk some, something. What was that? They can talk something. Oh, okay. Yeah, come on, I was up to Come on, we're well, tonight, tonight I'm just kind of observing, you yeah. know, but I just want to introduce myself. Yeah, and I'm going to be here to do this. Yeah, so welcome. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I introduced myself to Malabwe and Bahadi at the airport. I think they understood I wanted to ask questions, but I didn't want to scare them or conduct my first interview in a loud airport. We needed to get to know each other a little bit before I started asking questions. So, for the first few days, I showed up wherever they were, just trying to blend into what was probably a bewildering bunch of people. That started the night they arrived, as Upredi was showing them around their new apartment. One of the first things he showed them was the refrigerator. On the front of it was a list of emergency numbers, including one to call if there's domestic violence. 
It's pretty common back home. Uh, it was the same in my country. My father bit the hell out of me when I was young. Yeah. That is. You pretty showed them inside the refrigerator too. Yeah. Only anything that can get frozen can only go here. Yeah. The ice cream, meat, nothing like vegetables or anything else. It's gonna get bad. It's gonna get frozen. My colleague that night was photographer Drew Nash. He needed to document the moment too. I was trying to stay out of his shots, but still be close enough to hear the conversation and record audio. As a couple learned about the thermostat, the hot and cold faucets, and the deodorant and the toilet in the bathroom. One of the night's last lessons was the vacuum. Right. So, number one, plug it in. Yeah. So, uh, next thing, uh, you gotta push this button here. So, let me take it down so you can do it like this. Yeah. Okay. And then the red button here is the start. And if you need to stop, it's the same button. Yeah. Nikwamba, wakati ya nyongataka kujagia, kwanza unanza kufunya ala, dogo, juu ii, ii tijizike. That midnight crash course was just the beginning of a rapid, scripted series of lessons that's meant to prepare new arrivals for self-sufficiency. And the clock is ticking. After January, Malawi and Bahati won't receive any more spending money from the refugee center. In April, they'll have to start paying the rent and the power bill. In May, they'll have to start repaying their plane tickets. The pressure to learn enough English to find a job is huge, and it has to happen fast. We'll stick with this family for a year, watching their transition into Twin Falls life. And Titona and Drew will be there tomorrow when the second lesson starts. Come back for our next episode to hear the rapid-fire instructions and see how this family of four adjusts to their first weeks of American life. Refugees in a New Land is produced by The Times News in Twin Falls, Idaho, with Enterprise Editor Virginia Hutchins, reporters Titona Dunlap and Julie Wooten, photographers Drew Nash and Stephen Reese, and digital editor Kyle Hansen. Music by Chris Zabriskie. Find more about this project and complete coverage of South Central Idaho's news at magicvalley.com.